Welcome to the Megillah Project. One story, many angles. Come learn with us. I want to explore with you visual depictions of Megillah and Esther in five different examples. We're going to look at two medieval manuscripts, a medieval painted marriage chest, a late antique wall painting, as well as an early modern feminist painting. And the focus here is going to be how the visual representation of place serves as a dynamic storytelling device in order to create hierarchies of who's in and who's out, insider and outsider status, as well as to frame the narrative. And we'll see that on the one hand, architecture creates hierarchies of characters. And on the other hand, we see how architecture can form a commentary on how strong leadership emerges in unexpected places outside of these hierarchies. So let's start here with this illustrated Bible. It's called the Repol Bible. It's from 11th century Catalonia, and it's currently housed in the Vatican. It's one of the earliest known manuscripts to illustrate the Esther story. And we see here how urban architecture frames action. Let's zoom in a little more to see how this works. We see the multicolored blocks of Shushan that are forming a text-like column as image is replacing the written word. This artistic textuality continues through the image's composition where we have five rows of narrative constructed one above the other over here like the setting of lines on a page. In the top row, Ahasuerus is crowning Esther. Below that, we have him celebrating the, his marriage with a feast, what else? In the third row, we see Haman receiving Ahasuerus's signet ring. Below that, Haman is leading Mordechai on the horse. And finally, in the bottom row, Haman hangs, and to the left, we have Ahasuerus welcoming Esther. Not only do we have a representation of the story within the frame of the city walls, but we see how architecture and placement with on, within architecture connotes the, the role of certain characters. So in each row, there is one character who is the main character. And we see that in terms of where they're placed. They're placed in a prominent spot and all the other characters in that row are facing that main character. So in the first three rows, that is Ahasuerus. He sits to the left and everybody else is turned towards him. He's sitting on his cushioned throne. He's elevated. Everyone around him is standing or kneeling. He's clearly in a prominent position. Then when we get to the fourth row, there's a shift. Ahasuerus is no longer present. Rather, here we have Haman. And Haman is not on the left, he's on the right. So this change in movement and change in direction is also coming at a moment where the, where the narrative itself is changing direction and everything's beginning to be shaken up. Finally, in the last row, Haman is in that same spot on the right, but he's no longer prominent. He hangs and Ahasuerus resumes his spot on the left welcoming Esther. So what I'm trying to point out here and, and what we can see by looking closely at the images is that we're not just looking at a simple illustration of Megillah Esther, but that through how it's expressed in the illustration, it's telling a specific narrative and within this particular depiction, space matters in terms of showing us who's in charge, who's important, who we should be focusing on. The narrative of Megillah Esther similarly shows a deep interest in place. And we see in the Megillah an architectural negotiation of power that revolves around the space of the palace. Within the setup, we have the inner courtyard, which dominates as the highest point of status which is why Esther relays her fears to Mordechai that she doesn't feel confident that she can approach Ahasuerus in this space. And Mordechai encourages her that she has to overcome these spatial boundaries in order to save her nation. 
Space then holds power in terms of relative closeness to the palace. We see that the palace creates a ripple effect of prestige in relation to the ge geographic proximity to its center. So the first degree of separation is the king's gate. This, is, it, this serves as a gathering place for prestigious figures. For example, Mordechai spends his time here. The king's eunuchs are here, such as Big Tan and Teresh. We know that Haman spends his time here, as well as the king's servants, which is why when Mordechai refuses to bow down to Haman, it's such a big deal because he's denying him of his power in front of all of these powerful people in this powerful place. And when Mordechai is mourning because of Haman's decree, he actually cannot enter this space because it's too, it has too high of a status for a mourner to enter. Next, the next degree of separation are the streets of Shushan. This is the city itself, and so it's a public space for all to gather. Since it's the royal city, it still garners that certain level of high status, but it's, it's definitely a much more public area. So for example, when Mordechai can't enter the king's gate, where can he sit in mourning? He can sit here on the city, in the city streets. Um, when Haman is thinking about where should the king's honored man be paraded, this is where he should, be, he should be paraded because this is where everybody is going to see him. And then finally, we have the outermost layer, and that is the, the breadth of the whole kingdom. In this outermost layer, we see that news is spread from the center outward. So for example, with, um, with Vashti and the decree that comes from Vashti, there are letters sent from the king's palace to all of the provinces. With Haman's decree, similar, similarly, uh, the news is sent outward. With Esther and Mordechai's letter, the news is sent outward and also emotions spread outward. So when ha Haman's decree is declared, the whole kingdom is mourning, the Jews in the whole kingdom. And when Esther and Mordechai try to save the day, the whole kingdom is rejoicing. Within this attention to space throughout the Megillah, we see an emphasis on the role of the crowd, whether it's the king's advisors or the broader population. And they pop up all over the Megillah and they seem to present themselves in so many critical conversations and decisions that we may initially have thought that is only taking place between two figures within the palace walls. And what we see is that private action doesn't really exist inside the world of the palace. Internal decisions impact all external layers. So for example, Vashti's abstinency. Why does it matter so much to Ahasuerus that he has to take such a widespread effort in punishing her? Because he's worried that what she does, as, as Mimu Khan says, is going to impact all the women of the whole kingdom. Similarly with Haman, when Mordechai refuses to bow down to him, he doesn't wanna just punish Mordechai, he wants to punish the broader nation. These interpersonal moments become much wider and broader moments as something happening within the palace walls or something happening by the king's gate is then following that ripple effect and impacting the wider kingdom. We see this importance of the crowd also in the visual depictions in the Ripoll Bible. Look at all five of the rows. In each one of them, the crowd is here. The crowd is present watching the main action and they are part of it. They are witnesses to whatever is taking place. They are, the crowd is as important of a, char of a character as our protagonist. And we see that the crowd switches along with whatever the main action is. So when Ahasuerus is the king and crowd Esther, everyone's watching him. Haman comes along, everyone's watching him. Haman is now, now hangs and Ahasuerus is back with Esther, the crowd turns again. And so the crowd has an important role as witnesses, but they're very fluid and they move along with whatever is popular in the moment. Let's look at another Bible. This is called the Rhoda Bible. It's housed in the British Library and it is also an 11th century Catalan Bible. It's from the same monastic orbit as the Repul Bible. And it similarly relies on architecture to frame the Esther story as well as to emphasize the role of the crowd. 
this is the first folio that depicts the Esther story. And what we're looking at is uh, Ahasuerus's party on top. And beneath that, we're looking at Vashti's party. And we see how architecture is framing each party within its own gendered space. So on top, Ahasuerus's male party is taking place outside in the courtyard, in the gardens, courtyard gardens. Vashti's party is inside the palace walls. And the architecture is literally a frame. It really seems to be dividing these two spaces. But if you look closely, you'll see the male gaze encroaching in on the female party and how it's the, these male heads are kind of framing the party, showing that the, the tightness of these different spaces isn't actually as solid as we may think. And what's happening inside the palace walls is being watched and also foreshadows what's about to happen at this party. In both of these parties, we see the presence of the crowd and crowds continue on the following folio where the Esther story continues to be depicted. And the top row, we have the crowd watching the final standoff between Ahasuerus and Vashti. Beneath that, we have the crowd watching Esther being crowned. Beneath that, we have a crowd watching as Esther uh, embraces Ahasuerus, which we would think would be such a private moment. And then I think the last example is so interesting because Ahasuerus and Esther themselves, the main characters, become the crowd witnessing Mordechai riding on the, on the horse. The crowd here, just like in the Repo Bible is standing present as necessary characters to witness the palace action. In another cultural climate, 15th century Florence, we have a marriage chest that was painted by a collaboration of, in a workshop between a painter and a woodworker. And it's similar, similarly, we see the role of architecture and the crowd in the narrative movement of the Esther story. And just to show you how this would have looked on a marriage chest, here we have an, another example of a chest that was probably from their workshop as well. And we see the scene painted, the, the painted panel. Throngs of celebrants are accompanying the royal party. We have a contemporary Italian marriage that's mirroring the biblical one. In other words, Esther and Ahasuerus's marriage is being depicted in a 15th century Italian fashion. This one panel, we would think it's one scene, but it actually consists of three scenes. And the division of the scenes is based on different architectural spaces. The story begins outside on the city streets. Here, a crowd is accompanying Ahasuerus through the urban landscape as he rides to his wedding feast. The figure's movement directs the action from outside to entering the banquet hall. And the next scene takes place inside the banquet hall where we have Ahasuerus and Esther marrying and a priest officiating over their marriage. Even though the banquet hall seems to be one, one large scene or one activity, actually we see Esther appears again on the other side of the column sitting down at the table. And the column with the arches, they are dividing the space into two separate spaces, allowing for two separate scenes. Here, Esther is sitting and enjoying the wedding feast and Ahasuerus is watching her. This marriage chest shows us how we have three frames from outside to inside with the crowd directing the viewer towards the story's progression. So while the Megillah emphasizes the pomp and display of palace life, there are spe specific moments that remain private. For example, the quiet interaction, interactions of Esther and Mordecai, particularly those that revolve around her secret identity stands as foils to the public nature of palace life. As soon as she enters the palace, Esther stands in opposition to its public culture 
by holding back information about who she is and where she comes from. All of the examples that we've looked at so far, the Italian marriage test and the earlier Catalan Bibles show both the public display of palace action through the witnessing crowd, but they also show a scene of privacy that relates to Mordechai or Mordechai and Esther. So for example, here on the marriage chest, can you find Mordechai? He's an insider and an outsider. He stands here outside of the architectural frame, watching the action. He's participating in it. He is involved in it, but he's also alone and outside. And we, and we see how he's being presented in opposition to this bustling crowd of the palace life as standing alone. Similarly, in the Repul Bible, on the third line, Mordechai sits here along with the rest of the crowd watching Ahasuerus giving Haman his ring, but this architectural frame also places him in his own space. Finally, in the Rhoda Bible, we have Esther and Mordechai who are marked off in their own space having a private conversation, probably about not telling where she's from or encouraging her to go before Ahasuerus. In all, in all these examples, crowds fill the spaces of pal palace life, but architecture also carves out quiet moments for Mordechai and Esther. This publicity versus privacy place Ahasuerus and Haman in opposition to Esther and Mordechai. While the first group acts on emotions before a crowd of advisors and supporters, the latter group responds in a private, calculated manner. And the stability of architecture comments on the stability of the, char the characters. The king, a human embodiment of the palace walls, should epitomize stability. Yet his parties and his erratic approach to taxes stress his volatility. When he's happy, he celebrates with a feast, he lowers the taxes. When he's upset, he changes just as quickly. Ahasuerus has so much power, yet he is powerless to the whims of his emotions. Mordecai and Esther, in contrast, emerge as the strong characters. Rather than a lack of power and stability, their private nature reflects purposeful leadership. As opposed to Ahasuerus's many feasts, Esther knows when to hold a fast and when to hold a feast. And she calls these events not based on her emotions in the moment, but for a specific purpose. Her fast, like Ahasuerus's feasts, gather a large group together. Her feasts are small, not public shows, but calculated maneuvers. This surprising instability of the characters with power and the strength of the quieter figures manifests in, in art as well. This is a 17th century painting by Artemisia Gentileschi, who was actually a female painter, and she reverses the expected power play of the figures in this scene. While she models her painting after a 16th century painting, and we see a lot of similarities, we see how she also removes all of the extra characters. And in fact, the painting originally had a dog and a figure over here, which she painted over because she wanted to really focus on the attention of the drama between Ahasuerus and Esther. You can see here from the x-ray that there used to be a dog. And if you look closely at the painting, you can see the boy. The absence of the crowd draws attention to the drama between Esther and Ahasuerus and their respective roles in the throne room. Rather than a demure Esther who steps humbly before Ahasuerus, the painter subverts these expectations. The king's dress from his floppy hat with the oversized feathers, his slashed sleeves, and his fur-lined jewel boots, they present him as a, a character coming from a comedy. The queen, on the other hand, she's presented as a royal character. And Esther, she falls backward. What is that? What is that? What's the effect of her falling backward? It means that Ahasuerus is stepping up and moving forward. And so instead of a scene where the queen is entering and the throne room and approaching the queen, we have a scene where the king is approaching the queen. 
Without the crowd, the viewer can focus on the reversal of power between Achashverosh and Esther through these interactions. So this ability for visual placement to, re to relay so social hierarchies manifests in the earliest visual representation of the Purim story that we have, which is painted on the walls of the third century synagogue of Dura Europis in mm -hmm. Syria. This is a reconstructed panel, which is currently at Yale. And this is an example of where the panel would have fit within the synagogue space. Even though we don't have architecture in this panel, we can divide it into two scenes, probably. To the left, we have Mordechai riding the horse with Haman guiding him. And to the right, we have some sort of throne scene with Ahasuerus and Esther sitting on their thrones and their attendants behind them. But what is the specific moment on the right? I've seen so many different opinions from scholars about what's taking place here. Is this the king giving Haman permission to kill the Jews? Is this Ahasuerus lying awake at night, not being able to sleep and needing the book of remembrances to be read to him? Is this Achashverosh allowing Haman and Mordechai to uh, create a decree to counteract Haman's decree. The ambiguous nature of the scene, I think, shows us that we're not necessarily supposed to pinpoint it to a specific moment in the text, but it shows us how art works differently than the text. Rather than sim simply illustrating the Megillah, the image here is presenting the four main characters. Mordechai, Haman, Ahasuerus, and Esther. And through their placement within the scene, through their placement in space, it's showing us who these characters are and it's putting them together into a hierarchy. So for example, let's start with Mordechai. Mordechai, we see his elevated status in his Persian dress, his robes, which match those of Ahasuerus. He's being equated with the king. Haman, on the other hand, looks like a Roman stable boy. He seems to have the opposite status. He, he's being given a very low status here. Esther, she's a little bit more complicated because her throne is smaller than Ahasuerus's. She sits to his left. She seems to be given, a, you know, she seems to recede into the background. She seems to have a less high status. But if you look closely, the position of her, of her throne actually elevates her. And architecture, even though it doesn't appear in the scene, it actually does appear once with Esther through her crown, which is the crown of a Taiki, who was the goddess of fortune who presided over Hellenistic cities. And here are two other examples from Greco-Roman mosaic that show the Taiki with this crown. And the crown was supposed to represent the city wall. It's the architecture of the wall surrounding the city in order to symbolize how she is the protection for everything that takes place in that city. Within the scene, dress and spatial placement frame the figures in a purposeful way to comment on their role as leaders. Our close analysis of these artistic representations demonstrate how space impacts the narrative by forming hierarchies of places and people. In the Repole Bible, the Road of the Bible, and the Marriage Chest, we looked at how the architectural frames form story frames. And we discussed the palace as a central hub with anything that happening inside the palace impacting all external la layers. This led to our discussion about the fact that there's no privacy within the palace walls. And yet the only instances of privacy that we do have are with Esther and Mordechai. The public role of the palace seems to stand in contrast to the private nature of Mordechai and Esther who are defined by holding back and acting in a calculated way. The architectural constructs in the illustrated Bibles as well as the marriage chests form these moments of privacy and the stability of the architectural forms contrast with the stability of the characters in both Artemisia's painting as well as the Dura painting, which use space and dress to highlight th this disparity 
and to formulate an unexpected model of leadership, not by wealth, political control, or large crowds, but through purposeful choices of knowing when to step up and when to step back.